So, um, time to make a start. Um, this is my fifth dev world, um, so I'd like to thank the AUC for inviting me to present again, um, despite still not really doing any serious development work with Apple platforms uh, in my day job. Um, I have for the best part of three years now been working as, an, as an Android developer, and yes, this is an Apple development conference. Um, so in the past I've tended not to present about iOS or Android in specific, um, but I will be talking about mobile development related stuff today. Um, so today's talk is basically on the challenge of building mobile apps for multiple platforms. Um, most projects that I've been involved with uh, tend to involve the development of an Android application alongside an iOS application. Um, that's slightly changed with the current job I work on um, in that I produce an Android version of an app that basically works on iOS and Android. And I want to show you today sort of the, the techniques for how you get that done. And when I talk about apps that sort of run on multiple platforms, I'm not talking about things that have a cross-platform UI toolkit, things like, you know, PhoneGap or Titanium, things like that. Um, in my opinion, they tend to produce apps that look slightly weird on one platform and completely out of place on the other. So you've come into this talk um, basically with the end point of, of the... Um, of the talk already in your head. You've read the title, you know what the talk is about. Um, we're going to be talking about making apps that run on multiple platforms by having logic that is portable, but with a UI that's implemented in the native toolkit of the platform that you're targeting. And the platforms that I can discuss are iOS versus Android. So basically that's the end of the talk. You can produce an app that has portable logic and native UI. Thank you very much. You want more talk? I, have, I, I can do that. Um, so yeah, this talk is going to talk about something completely different. Um, and that's basically how we get to the point where you can design an app that runs on multiple platforms. So this is a sort of a talk about software engineering concepts um, more than actually writing code. And what I want to get across to you during this talk is how to understand uh, modularity of software uh, what it is, how you can spot it, and what it lets you do. And the payoff is that by the end of the talk, you'll understand the engineering concepts that let you make cross-platform code in the way I've just described. So we're going to cover three things in the talk. The first is to look at some engineering theory, uh, how to think about app design. And then we're going to show you something you've probably already seen before, but from the point of view of writing modular software. Um, then we'll look at how you can produce an app with cross-platform logic. So with that in mind, we can now begin. The first part of the talk um, deals with how to think about producing a modular piece of software. Uh, so we'll cover some ideas that you've seen before in isolation, but hopefully you do a decent job of linking these ideas together. So who here knows about mobile development? You know, iOS, stuff like that. Right, it's a mobile development conference. You're probably here as a mobile developer. Um, it's actually quite a comparatively new thing. Um, mobile development, as we know, it didn't really start until 2008. And yes, while that might be a, a very long time in computer years, um, it's not really as far back as I want to go back to. Uh, I want to look as far back as 1974, uh, when television was in black and white. Um, James Bond was a comedian in flared trousers. Uh, John Howard hadn't even been elected to Parliament. And Richard Nixon was President of the United States. Um, there was another person who was around then. His name uh, was uh, Edgar Dijkstra. And in 1974, he wrote a paper or an essay called On Scientific Thought. And in that paper, he recounted how he was asked to analyze how computer programs behaved. And he said, well, you can look at the different, you can look at many different ways of analyzing how a computer program works. Uh, if you want to look at uh, how a program performs, where you can consider speed or correctness or what the code looks like, and these are all worthy features of consideration. But it's very difficult to consider all of these aspects um, simultaneously. And he concluded that rather than considering all of these issues at the same time, it's best to analyze these things as a sum of their parts. He said, nothing is gained by tackling all these various concerns simultaneously. 
Um, it's what I sometimes call the separation of concerns. Considering each aspect separately allows you to think about each aspect's merits and attractions and only to consider how these aspects interact with each other, uh, but not in, not in combination. So when you talk about separation of concerns, you're not looking at how, um, how a system performs, it's instead considering all the various features of an application in isolation. So when we talk about separation of concerns, you need to look at what a concern is. Uh, according to Wikipedia, this is anything that has an effect upon a system as a whole. So it could be something that interacts with a database. It could be something that displays things to a user. It's basically anything that can affect any observable part of a system. Which is quite a vague observation. So the separation of concerns becomes the act of dividing your system so that any observable part of your system is dealt with by different pieces of code. Or more clearly, to design separate aspects of an application in isolation. So that only these, so these aspects only interact where absolutely necessary. So an app that doesn't separate its concerns looks something like this. You have one logical unit of code and it does everything the app needs to do within that unit. Um, if you've seen badly written PHP code, you've probably seen something like this. This is where you do your database queries in the middle of producing your output. So you can't separate the act of querying the database from producing output. The concerns of fetching information and displaying it on the screen are not separated. Uh, an app where these concerns are separated has several logical units of code that are only joined at a very small point. And the point where these two separated concerns meet is called the interface. Um, in this case, because we're talking about writing bits of code in applications, this is also called an application programming interface or API. And the key thing you need to take away from this idea is that if you separate your concerns, and so code that exhibits separation of concerns is modular. Um, so now we know what separation of concerns is, we need to know why it's important and why you should consider it. So say you have a massively multiplayer online wobbling simulator. Um, so because it's massively multiplayer and online, um, sending stuff is actually quite a pretty important feature of it. Um, now if you need to send stuff, you'll need to have some sort of network to send things over. Now say you've also got an internet banking application that's completely different to the game that I was talking about beforehand, but it also needs to send stuff across a network. So that's basically something that these apps have in common. Whilst they appear to do completely different things to the user, basically in essence they're stuff that take information from a user and sends it somewhere. So these apps basically to a computer look like so something like this. It's an app that sends some stuff to some sort of place. But as a programmer, we can sort of think of these two things separately. You can think about what to send, and you can think about where you want to send it. So these are two separated concerns that are joined by an interface, and that interface is basically your standard TCP IP sockets library or something like that. And this is a key observation because if you're an Ethernet cable, there's basically no difference between a banking application and a game. And this is actually a pretty powerful idea because for 100 years we had a telephone system where there was no difference between making a call on a telephone and the wires that was used to transmit it. Until we separated concerns, we could only send voice. Once we separated concerns, we had data networks. Um, other applications of sending, separating concerns, things like separating your CSS from your HTML when you're doing web development. Um, this is a concrete idea of separating information from presentation. And possibly the most ubiquitous one that you're familiar with um, is object orientation, where you encapsulate data and behavior so that you can use each piece of uh, data and behavior in isolation from each other and you can use it in different projects and stuff like that. So this is basically packaging your code into modules or in the form of classes. A key side effect of having modular code is a thing called coupling. So I'll explain what coupling is. Basically you have an interface between two modules of a code, two separated concerns. When you implement 
this interface. So when one code, or one bit of code depends on another bit of code, you've created what is called a coupling. Couplings are, point, are, to, are points where two modules become unavoidably attached. And when you have more coupling, you have less separation. So coupling comes in many shapes and sizes, and I'm gonna describe two of them. The first aspect of it is what I'm gonna call breadth. Breadth is the range of places that need to be joined in order to fulfill an interface. So if you have two features, then broad coupling means that you have lots of points that need to be joined in order to communicate between two aspects of your code. Um, this tends to look like having lots and lots of methods on an interface, and each of these methods implements, or so sends, a very small amount of information. And if your coupling ends up being very, very broad, then it basically means that there's no difference between each module, so there's not really any point in separating it. The other aspect you consider is depth. Depth is the amount of stuff that you need to communicate at a single interface in order to get information between two parts of a system. Deep coupling is code that minimizes the number of points where you couple, but in doing so, you have to provide a really large amount of information to transfer at the interface. Uh, these look like methods that have lots of parameters, or even big parameter objects that contain all the information that you need to send across the interface. So if your coupling is very deep, then it basically means that you're transferring all the state from one module to another, which is quite inefficient. So the coupling between modules impedes modularity. The stronger the coupling between two potential modules, the less modular they are, and the less you can consider them as separate parts. So here's a graph. Deep coupling maximizes the amount of information transferred at the interface at the expense of ways to transfer it. And broad coupling maximizes the number of points where information can be transferred at the expense of complexity, or number of points. The ideal is to sort of minimize both of these so that you minimize the amount of information that needs to be transferred as well as the number of points where it can be transferred. So, so far we've seen that separating concerns uh, re produces flexible code. Separated concerns allows you to view your code with more modularity and coupling is the result of needing to communicate between modules. So you should reduce coupling as much as possible in your projects. So we know what separation of concerns is now. Let's look at this in an application. I'm gonna look at web services. Um, APIs are sort of kind of cool. They let you make mobile apps um, around network API. Um, they're great, so you can sort of put things like Twitter or Foursquare or map-like map -like stuff um, into your apps by communicating with servers that are somewhere else. Um, and indeed, lots of mobile apps these days are basically just front ends to web services. So let's take a look at how this idea works demonstrating separation of concerns. So I'm gonna make a pretend app that sort of does a contrived sort of thing so I can make a, an easy example. Um, so we're gonna look at an app that, make, that thinks about locations. Um, you can have friends as a user and you can do feedback and stuff at, at locations. Basically I'm replicating Foursquare. Um, but where's the fun in sort of saying I'm gonna rip off something entirely? So we've got a question. And to think about how to find where your nearby friends are. And we're gonna consider two models for this. The first one I'm gonna call the federated model, and the other I'm gonna call the index model. So the first model I'm gonna look at is the federated one. So in this structure, which could be seen as quite reasonable, we have a client, purple thing, that wants to find some friends, and we have some friends who want to report their location. So if a client wants to go out and find where the friends are, it has to go and ask all the friends where they are, and it will send a request to each of those friends, and each of those friends sends back a response. Um, this model is quite flawed in terms of mobile development. Um, the main one tends to arise from it being quite tightly coupled. It's, it's tightly coupled because each client needs to be able to communicate with each other to get a full picture of how the entire network works. Um, and the role of figuring out where the friends are, as well as displaying where your friends are, is not separated. Um, 
So say you're visiting Sydney, well, you might have a single friend in Sydney, but most of your friends are still in Melbourne. Well, you still have to make all those random extra requests, and not all of them are going to be terribly useful to finding your, your nearby friends. You need to make a lot of unnecessary requests to get anything that resembles the full picture. This is really, really broad coupling. And this is the reason, or one of the reasons, why models like Diaspora doesn't work. Who's, who's heard of Diaspora? It's um, basically a federated um, open source Facebook clone. So instead of having a centralized index, uh, you have individual nodes. And basically the idea is that you run your own node to maintain privacy of your own data. But the problem is that if you want to have a full picture of the network, you need to communicate with every node that's out there and it's really quite inefficient. Um, so the alternative is to have something called an indexed model. Um, so in this model, you still have a client, you still have a bunch of friends, but we also had this thing called a magic index box. Um, this magic index box knows everything about where your friends are. Um, and it works basically by your friends, sometimes telling the magic index box where they are. And so when you want to know when your friend, where your friends are, you just need to ask the index box and it tells you. Um, who recognizes how this, what sort of model this sort of thing uses? Right, it's a client server model. Um, this model, the role of the client, is basically just to mention where they are sometimes and sometimes to ask where its friends are. The role of the server is to accept location updates and to figure out what to send to the clients that want to know where their friends are. And this is a separation of concerns. The task of determining what to display is done by the server. The task of displaying it is done by the client. And further to that, actually having a network interface um, gives you a good opportunity to consider where to separate your concerns. Um, in fact, having to send stuff over a network means that you must separate your concerns somehow. Um, so in this case, we've basically made the clients just a provider of information to the server. So when a client asks for information, the only thing it needs to do is display the information that comes back from it. This makes the client much more lightweight, there's less complexity at the client side, and it also keeps the, uh, the task of maintaining the state of the network um, somewhere other than the client. So the structure of your network interface also impacts upon the performance you have. Um, you need to structure your app in such a way that the interface between your client and your server behaves well over whatever protocol you're using to communicate. Um, that's probably going to be HTTP because that's what most people use. So if you're using HTTP to define an API, we well, have two aspects that you need to consider. The first is that you have requests. That's when your client asks the server for stuff. And then you have responses, which is what the server sends back. The requests that you can make defines the interface between the client and the server. Um, each aspect of the interface is called an endpoint, so that's like a unique URL as part of the API. Responses need to figure out how to send stuff back over the client. Uh, when you need to convert an object so it can be sent over a network, this is called serialization. And in the case of any network-bound app, any coupling between the client and the server directly impacts performance. That's because network calls take time. And time is a really important resource in terms of making apps appear responsive. So that firstly, the number of endpoints you have increases the breadth of coupling in your application. Having more requests implies a greater number of points where your app depends on the network to provide information. And this increases latency. You also have to do more implementation on the client side to provide features. And yes, having lots of, of endpoints increases the re total request latency because you need to make more requests. And then serializing your responses, that's wrapping objects in JSON or whatever, that increases the depth of each coupled object. Um, this is my favorite example. This comes from Twitter. When you ask for a single tweet, uh, you get all this JSON, including all the information required to render their profile page, and the text is Hang on, um, whoa, where'd it go? Right, there, 
Um, that's a lot of information, and you have to send that to the user each time. And if that fails, you have to go back and ask for all that all over again. So if a single large response fails, then your app takes more time to re-download stuff and remake that response. If you have smaller response objects, you can partially render stuff and make, make your app look more responsive by showing some stuff, even if you can't show all of it. So here's a graph. Um, yeah, big responses um, at the, uh, when you have uh, not many endpoints. And when you have lots of endpoints, you have small responses. And the ideal is, of course, minimizing both of these. And you've probably seen this graph before, just with slightly different um, labels. I used this slightly earlier in the talk. So in summary for this section, we know that having a client-server model is actually a separation of concerns issue. You figure out what role the server plays, what role the client plays, and that way you can determine what functionality be, uh, belongs on each. Um, having a network interface introduces coupling sort of by de definition. So considering what goes over the network is a great place to figure out how to separate your concerns. And in terms of HTTP, endpoint count and response size is a trade-off in terms of coupling. How are we going? You following? Fantastic. Um, so basically, now that I've covered all the groundwork that you need, we can now explain what you need to do to actually make code that's portable. So I said earlier that basically every app that's out there these days is just a lightweight thing that talks to some sort of web service or something like that. Sometimes your app actually needs to do stuff on the client side rather than just being a front end. Um, if you actually need to do stuff on a client side, then just being a front end doesn't work. You're going to need substantial client side logic. And if your project needs to have clients on multiple platforms, then you need to figure out how to make the same logic work for each platform. The trade off here is usually between being completely cross platform, where you lose consistency with the rest of the system, so you have a UI that's unfamiliar doesn't look very nice on any platform you deploy it to, stuff like that, or writing an entire app for each platform, which doubles your code base, increases your test burden, doesn't scale to adding further clients. So what we want to look at is whether you can have the same code on multiple platforms. Um, so let's take a look at how you can do this. The first step is to choose a language that facilitates deploying code onto multiple sorts of devices. Um, I take it most people here are sort of iOS developers. Yeah, iOS developers. So the idea of choosing a language is probably quite counterintuitive to you because you, know, you already write all your code in Objective-C to target iOS. Unfortunately, Objective-C isn't really a language that's supported anywhere other than on Apple platforms. So if you want to take your Objective-C code onto Android, well, that's not really something you can do. So let's look at what the options are. Well, the iOS develop mod development model is actually quite simple. You write Objective-C code, you compile it, and then the compiler produces machine code that you can run on your iPhone, your iPad, your whatever. And Objective-C is actually a pretty easy case to choose a complementary language for because Objective-C uses this, this thing called the C calling convention. This is basically a standard interface for um, libraries to use so that you can basically import a header file and then suddenly um, your code knows how to call other code. Uh, it's a standardized way for different programs or different languages to work with each other. And another language that uses the C calling convention to some extent is C++. Um, Objective-C codes tend to be diametrically opposed to C++ as a language, but it's actually quite a good fit here. It's cross-platform, it's object-oriented, so you can still design your code with object orientation, with object hierarchies, all that. And importantly, you can import C libraries and make calls using the C calling convention. And this basically means that you can make C++ and Objective-C compatible. 
And even better, there's a language called Objective C++, which is where you basically put C++ codes inside your Objective C source. It actually works. Um, this makes C++ a really natural choice for writing a, uh, the cross-platform aspects of your code. Uh, the situation in Android, though, is considerably more complicated than it is for iOS. Uh, so this en invariably ends up being where the majority of engineering work goes. So what does the Android development model look like? Uh, well, basically, you, you work in a managed environment that kind of sort of looks like the JVM. Um, so the first two steps, basically the same as they are for Java. You write some Java code. You compile it into JVM bytecode. Then there's an extra couple of steps. Uh, you convert to a thing called Dalvik bytecode, which makes your Java code target Android's VM, and then you execute it on the Android VM. So you write your code in Java, and it runs on some magic not-quite-JVM thing called Dalvik. The good news is that even though it's not the JVM itself, um, it implements a thing called the Java Native Interface. And the Java Native Interface lets you basically take advantage of code that's compiled down to machine code for your um, target device, um, but call it from within the managed environment of Dalvik. And the JNI looks something like this. You declare a method as native within your, within your Java code, and the JNI figures out what function you need to call within a C library, and then your code magically gets executed when you call the Java method. And this is all thanks to the C calling convention. Java knows how to load a C library, and it knows how to load the right parts of a C library to call those various functions within the library. Unfortunately, the JNI is quite obtuse. It's difficult to write code for. It takes a long time. Um, I use a tool called Java CPP, which is basically a, um, a tool where you add annotations to your Java code, and then you run it against this command line tool, which spits out um, a bunch of C++ code that implements the JNI calls that you need to call into your C++ code. So you can basically have a class hierarchy on the Java side that matches the class hierarchy on the C++ side. So what Java C++ lets you do is construct wrappers. Wait, sorry, construct wrappers. Uh, wrappers are bits of Java code that hide the details of translating between C++ and Java. So this is quite cool. You don't have to think that you're calling a C++ object from within Java um, because Java CPP wrappers just magically cause the translations to happen. But having wrappers is a natural source of coupling. It's basically intractable. You're writing interface code that goes from Java to C++. The point where you do your wrapping, hap uh, the point where your wrapping happens must be the interface between the two code bases. Um, and writing wrappers is a sink in terms of both developer time, because wrapping, um, wrapping basically means you're translating code that's written in one language into another language, you have to write at least some of the wrappers, if not all the generated code yourself, which can be time consuming. And this translation bit also takes uh, execution time. If you need to fetch data from C++, then you need to make a Java call, which, makes, which loads a C library, calls a function to C library, does some translation, and you eventually call C++. So it's not sort of doing an instant method call, it's not a direct method call, so it takes extra time. Um, so you need to think about where this happens. So now that we've looked at both, uh, both platforms and how you can sort of do uh, cross-platform development in, in one way, um, let's talk about how you can think about separating your code into native and portable sections. And to remind you, the main reason why we even have design patterns um, is to make it obvious how to separate your concerns. In particular, we're looking at how you separate UI from logic. So who's heard of this one, MVC, Model View Controller? Uh, if you've done any iOS development, it's basically the way you structure an iOS app. Um, so basically this involves separating each part of your code into a model, which deals exclusively with storing data, a view, which deals exclusively with displaying data, as well as taking inputs from the user, and a controller, which, which intermediates between the two. So it 
actually looks more like this, model controller view. Uh, if you're trying to separate between the portable code and native UI code, well, the interface between the two should sit between the controller and the view. The problem with this approach is that how the controller and the view are linked is generally quite undefined. This means that coupling between the view and the controller can be very strong. So if you need to write a wrapper between the controller and the view, it can be really difficult unless you've considered um, exactly how you're going to communicate stuff from the controller to the view. If you haven't considered that, you probably get very complex wrappers, which is a waste of developer time because you have to maintain a class on each side of the interface. This problem is, uh, is solved by a newer approach, which is known as model view view model, or MVVM. And the point of MVVM is to give yourself a standard way to translate between low-level code and display code. So it's basically MVC with some slight modifications. So basically, describe the components of MVVM in the wrong order, just like MVC. It actually looks something more like this. So you have a model, and the model can also include aspects of the controller, um, as per MVC. Um, the difference is that the view code and the low-level code is joined by a new class called a view model. And the role of the view model is basically to give the view the complete set of information that it needs to display information in a given time. So it's basically a model which directly updates the, uh, the contents of the view. And it also provides enough properties to set that can update the underlying data. So this means that the interface between cross-platform and native code is once again between the view model and the view code, but the difference is that it's really, really obvious what you need to wrap. You just wrap the view model. You, map, you wrap every single property in the view model, and that's all you need to do. Um, if you've used something like Django Web Framework or other web frameworks, you might be familiar with something like this. You have a model and you have a, a Django view, which is basically a controller and MVC. You export data into something that updates a template or some template data, and the template goes and renders off the view. Um, so while the idea of MVVM has only really been explained in the last couple of years, um, it's been around for quite some time. Um, so this is where I get to talk about the stuff I do for work. Um, I work on a file management tool for business users called Azdec Docs. And pretty early on in the product's life, the decision was made to structure our code, so we had a portable core as well as native UI. And this is because we do some interesting things and we're quite a small team. We do the management and synchronization of files on a device. Um, so having these two features written in portable code means that we have one well-tested code base for dealing with synchronization and storage of files. And we also do on-device cryptography and security. Um, in the context of business use, um, these are two really important things, and we need to make sure that our product does exactly what it says we say, um, does exactly what we say it does. So having one code base makes it easier to guarantee that it's doing the same thing every time, rather than multiple clients implementing a spec. For us, the only option was really to make our code cross-platform. So we could have made something using a toolkit like Qt or something like that, runs on basically everything. Um, but we also provide ourselves on making an app that looks good on both platforms. We have a tool that looks at home on iOS, where it was originally designed, and it also looks great on Android. Uh, for that, we've needed our UI to be native and idiomatic on both platforms. And we actually have clients released on both Android and iOS at this point, and there are more coming. Our approach to separating portable core from uh, native UI has actually proven more scalable than we even thought it would be at the start of the project. And so we actually have some opportunities to explain how this works for us. What we've learned, where things can improve. Oops. The first is that we made an active decision to design our app to work on multiple platforms. This means that we needed to actively decide where code belongs on a single device and where code belongs on all devices. Um, writing logic in C++ 
um, establishes an upper bound on what's cross-platform because you can't do UI code in C++ for Java or iOS. You have to use the native languages for that. Um, where we find that we've put logic in the UI layer or something like that, where we've produced code that is accidentally not cross-platform, our policy is normally to bring it down into the portable code so that when the second person has to implement it, uh, say I have to implement it for Android, um, I do the work in bringing it back into the portable layer so that when a third client comes along and needs to implement that stuff, um, they don't have to write the logic a third time over again. Rewriting functionality does not scale. Um, you probably guessed that we use C++ for our um, core because it's what I've talked about. Um, C++ has a lot of language constructs uh, and a lot of those language constructs don't appear in other languages. This is things like, I know, function pointers, um, implicit copy constructors, things like that. Um, these are things that exist in C++ that don't exist in Objective-C, don't ex exist in Java. Not so much uh, a problem for Objective-C because you can just call C++ code in there. But in Java, well, if you don't have functions, let alone function pointers, then how are you going to do stuff at your interface that implements a function pointer? Work to replicate non-compatible language features increases coupling and it produces code smells on, say, the Java side of things. So think about what constructs um, you're going to use in your core language and make sure that the languages that you use to implement your interface has analogs to those constructs. So have classes that implement a runnable interface so that you can just call run on a class rather than having function pointers in C++ or something like that. Um, you need to plan for your code to be wrapped. Figuring out how to wrap a C++ class is actually quite a large sink of developer time if the C++ class is complex. So if you design for iOS first, this is actually a really bad idea because there's no effort to call C++ code from iOS. Uh, also using MVC here is quite a bad idea because basically if you expose each element of your view inside your view class, then that's a, each a coupling point that has to be replicated on another platform. Thinking about how your core classes are going to look in another language is a great way to consider which weird features of C++ or whatever to drop. Um, you need to design with opinion. Um, C++ is quite an unopinionated language. It has lots of features um, which allow you to basically do anything you like. Um, figure out what aspects of the language you want to use. You need to figure out what your design goals are and choose a subset that lets you accomplish that easily with every language that will be calling into your core code. Um, you need to make it very clear what code provides logic and you need to make it clear how a UI can attach itself to its logic. Um, this is the most important separation of concerns that you can make between, or you can make in your app, the separation of UI and logic. If you choose design patterns that make it easy to determine what belongs on which side of the code base, this makes things much easier. Um, MVVM is working really, really well for us because view models are a really obvious target for writing wrappers around. And if you're a fan of native libraries on iOS in a lot of cases, things like using on-device crypto, HTTP requests, stuff like that, um, this introduces complexity on, uh, on the core side because you need to implement interfaces that go back up into the native libraries. Um, this increases your testing burden because you need to have tests on each client. Um, it's often not a good idea. If you can find cross-platform libraries that solve your problems as opposed to native ones, use those. Um, even if it avoids libraries available on each platform. This also means that you reduce your testing burden because the behavior is going to be the same on each client. So in summary, um, we looked at the separation of UI versus logic, which is basically a separation of concerns issue. Um, and if you successfully separate these concerns, you can have your logic written in one language that runs on all the platforms you target, so you only need to write UI code for each platform. Um, in the case of Android, 
and also probably in the case of Windows and things like that, where you don't have um, where you don't have native uh, C++ calls, um, Android needs code wrapping, which is a really really clear point of coupling. And you should really aim for simplicity in the bits where you have to couple between the two aspects of your code base. So a quick summary of where we can take this approach from here. The first is to use things like scripting or interpreted languages, um, things that aren't quite as rigid as C++. Um, there's a lot more flexibility in languages like Python, for example. So if performance isn't a bottleneck, then you can gain from libraries that automatically do wrapping. Um, in the case of Python, I've been reliably informed that PyObjective-C works okay on iOS, and there's a, um, a library called PyGenius as part of the Python on Android project. Um, both of these automatically produce wrappers of your native, uh, so your, your native UI classes into Python, so that you can basically directly call into the um, into those languages. And also, well, the, the, this approach, separating out a portable core from your UI, has a lot of merit. It's worked really, really well for us. That said, it, it still seems to be quite an unusual approach at the moment. Uh, we've figured out what a lot of our own best, best practices are as we go along. And these lessons tend to have come from writing a second client to attach to portable core, rather than in the development of our logic code. We haven't written logic code and said, this is the absolute perfect interface uh, for every platform. Normally we've figured out where the pain points are when we get around to our second implementation. Um, having more people going out and doing this sort of thing is going to help develop best practices. So if you go and do this, uh, write about it. Uh, tell the world what libraries you've used, what best practices you've developed. Give a talk, something like that. Um, so that basically brings us to the end of the talk. So we know you can write apps for each platform with a native, consistent UI for each platform, but with a substantial common code base. So how do we get here? We started looking at the separation of concerns, which is a key idea in software engineering, and it's the basis of making mod uh, modular, manageable software. So separation of concerns, it gives us modularity. Um, in the case of web services, we saw that it gives us a way to manage complexity of the tasks that an app needs to solve, what belongs on the client, what belongs on a server. And finally, it gives us portability. By separating concerns, we can make part of our code run on one platform, but make the rest of the code run on lots of platforms. Uh, we discovered that good web APIs help to separate concerns. If you expose functionality on the server side, it can make it easier to reduce complexity on the client side. And we also saw that if you keep the logic of your code modular from your UI, then you succeed in making your logic code portable. And all of this arises strongly from considering how to separate the concerns of your app. And that's the end. Are there any questions? No? Well, thank you all for coming along. I hope you enjoyed it.